I'm Richard Becker, the Stonehill Endowed Chair and Professor of Medicine, Chief of Cardiology at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. I'm also the Physician in Chief and Director of our Heart, Lung, and Vascular Institute. Today I'm going to be discussing antithrombotic management in patients with atrial fibrillation and coronary artery disease. Non-valvular atrial fibrillation is the most common arrhythmia amongst adults in the United States and also around the world. It's anticipated by 2025 that there will be as many as 25 and possibly 30 million adults in the United States with atrial fibrillation. The challenge that we face as clinicians and also for the overall population is that atrial fibrillation is a very, very common cause of stroke, which can be either fatal or disabling, and is a major cause of healthcare expenditures in the United States. The important thing is that stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation is preventable, and that we have several anticoagulants, all oral anticoagulants, that effectively reduce the likelihood of stroke by 50 to 70 to 80 percent, so we do have effective therapies. Another challenge for clinicians is the fact that many of our, our patients with atrial fibrillation have coexisting coronary artery disease, very, very common. And clinicians are often faced with the question of, how do I treat patients that have both atrial fibrillation and coronary artery disease? My approach is, is fairly straightforward. I utilize the existing literature and the evidence. And the first question I ask is, for someone with atrial fibrillation, what is their risk of stroke? And to answer that question, I, I employ the CHAD score or the CHAD's VAS score. And I will look at patients and I will classify them as being at low, moderate, or high risk. Similarly, for patients with coronary disease, we, we have risk scores that allow us to gauge a person at being at low, moderate, or high risk for a coronary artery related disease event, such as acute stent thrombosis. So when all said and done, I have a patient with atrial fibrillation classified into risk categories. I have patients with coronary disease classified into risk categories. And then the last thing that I do is ask a fundamental question. What is the risk of bleeding from an anticoagulant, from platelet-directed therapies such as aspirin and clopidogrel, and then for that person that has both atrial fibrillation and coronary artery disease, what is the likelihood of bleeding if I were to put a patient on dual or triple antithrombotic therapy? So it's very much evidence-based, at least the, the best available evidence-based. So let's walk through this in a little bit of detail and look at it from a clinician's perspective. By definition, optimal antithrombotic therapy for someone with atrial fibrillation should reduce the likelihood of stroke and should do so without increasing the likelihood of major or fatal bleeding. A patient with coronary artery disease should receive antithrombotic therapy with the goal of reducing the likelihood of myocardial infarction, stent thrombosis, or a fatal coronary heart disease related event. Now, once I've placed my patients into those risk categories, low, intermediate, and high risk, then I'm prepared to start thinking about what is the optimal antithrombotic therapy. So as an example, if I have a patient with atrial fibrillation with a chance score that is less than two, but that person has a coronary artery stent, I may not need an anticoagulant. I may use dual antithrombotic therapy in the form of aspirin and clopidogrel, or aspirin plus ticagrelor, or aspirin plus prasperin. On the other extreme, if I have a patient with atrial fibrillation 
with a, a high chance score or chance VAS score, I know that I'm going to need an anticoagulant to minimize their risk of, of stroke. Now, if that person has concomitant coronary disease but is at low risk for stent thrombosis or a coronary event, I might be able to use an anticoagulant monotherapy or possibly add either aspirin or clopidogrel. Now, the reason that I haven't mentioned ticagrelor or prasugrel is mainly because we don't have randomized data in terms of how to combine an anticoagulant and a third or fourth generation platelet antagonist. Now, on the extreme would be the person with atrial fibrillation a high chance score, but also at high risk for stent thrombosis or a coronary heart disease related event. In that individual, I typically would use triple antithrombotic therapy. And because most of our literature is with a vitamin K antagonist, aspirin and clopidogrel, that is the direction that I would typically go. I may use that for the initial two to three months after a stent has been placed. And then I would transition to a combination of a vitamin K antagonist plus clopidogrel based on the WOAS trial, which, albeit small, is a randomized trial that has given us a little bit of guidance in terms of treating patients that have indications for both anticoagulant as well as platelet-directed therapies. One of the most common questions that clinicians will ask, and rightfully so, is what is the risk of bleeding when you're making a decision about antithrombotic therapy, whether it's mono or dual or triple therapy. And there are bleeding scales that have been developed. One of them is called has bled. It's seen in a number of guidance documents, including the, of the, the European Society of Cardiology, um, not used quite as often uh, in the United States, but I think it is an important scale for clinicians to be aware of, specifically in, in patients in whom the risk of bleeding is very high. So this is an individual in whom considerations uh, are ongoing for treatment, and they have a has bled score that is four or greater, which means very high, or a person that's had an intracranial hemorrhage within the last six months. In those circumstances, actually the risk of treatment may outweigh the benefit of treatment. For a majority of patients, it is, it is rare that you find that type of relationship. But I would suggest to clinicians that they become familiar with has bled, particularly for individuals with a has bled score of four or greater, and then think about the options for treatment very, very carefully. Those are my three pearls, if you will, for the treatment of this very, very common patient population.